Hello and welcome to another Hebrew video here on Solomon's Cave. In the first video about Hebrew nouns, we looked at masculine and feminine. But this video will delve into a more familiar topic, namely singular and plural. And yes, we will also have a look at dual, but I will save that for the second part of the video. Now the advantage of singular and plural is that I hardly have to explain what it means if a noun has a singular or a plural form. Singular means that it refers to just one of something, either one thing or one person, and plural means that it refers to two or more. And this division is about 95% similar to English. So let's have a look at the forms of singular and plural for both masculine and feminine. Now the masculine singular form is the easiest, and they usually are the standard dictionary form. The plural form of the masculine word is pretty simple too, and there is one standard way of making a masculine word plural, and that is by adding im at the end of a normal masculine word, a hirek under the last consonant, followed by a yod and a maim. Let's look at some examples here. Sus is masculine singular, male horse. And susim is masculine plural, so male horses. Here's another example. Kochav, star, and kochavim, stars. Simple enough, eh? Well, it does become a bit more tricky for some other words. Like with melech, king. You might suspect that the plural becomes melechim. But actually, it is melachim. Hmm, so you do get the standard im ending that signals it is most likely a masculine plural word. But what's up with the vowels? Yeah, that is what happens with a bunch of masculine words. All the consonants stay the same, and you get the normal regular plural ending. But the vowels can change a little bit. Here's another example. Davar, which means word does not become davarim, but instead it becomes davarim, words. But hey, I'm not going to give you all the rules for how the vowels change in which circumstance, since that is not the goal of this series. You just have to recognize the im ending and know it is typically a masculine plural ending. And then you have to look at the consonants to see if you recognize which word it is. And if the vowels don't make sense at first sight, Remember that they may have changed a bit when the word became plural. So what about feminine words? How do they change? Well, a typical feminine word ends with a. A kamat under the last letter, followed by a he. Like susa, mare. Okay, so the first thing you have to do in this case is take away the a ending. And then replace it with oath. So you get susoth. Mers, or mishpacha, family, you take away the a, now you add the oath, and we get mishpachoth, families. And just as with the masculine words that become plural, feminine words sometimes change the vowels too. Like with eretz, land. Here we don't have to take away the a ending first, so we can just slap oath at the ending, and we get Aretzoth. And that's it. Those are all the basic rules regarding making, or better, recognizing masculine and feminine plurals. Here they are in a nice little table. Sus, male horse. Susim, male horses. Susa, mare. Susoth, mares. Okay, so what about exceptions? Yes, there are exceptions, the bane of all language learners. Here are some of the most common exceptions. First, some exceptions of feminine words that take a masculine ending. The first one is isha, woman, which changes to nashim, women. So not only does it take a masculine ending, it also changes the word somewhat. So it is irregular in two ways. Then Shana, year, and this becomes Shanim, years. And finally, Ir, city, becomes Irim, 
cities. And what about the other way around? Well, there is one famous example of that, where the word Av, father, becomes Avoth, fathers or ancestors. And then there are some words that take the normal expected ending, but they do change their form somewhat. For example, Ish, man, becomes Anashim, men. Bath becomes Banoth, daughters, and Baith, house, becomes Batim, houses or households. And of course there are more, but these are among the most common ones, and you'll have to learn most of them as you go along. So what's next? Let me transition to the next topic by saying a few words about how singular and plural work in Hebrew. For though I said that it is nearly identical to English, there are some ways in which Hebrew is different. There are a few words that are collectives, that have a singular form, but should probably be translated as a plural in English. One common example is the word oaf, which means bird or birch, or the word dagan, which means fish or fish. And then tzon means either sheep or sheep. Yeah, so as you can see, English can have a similar ambiguity. However, in English you know by the verb whether it is a singular or a plural. Like the difference between the fish is orange or the fish are orange. But in Hebrew, these kinds of collective words always take a singular verb form. And then it is up to the reader or the translator to determine whether the meaning is singular or plural. And now we are ready to look at dual. The dual is a kind of plural form that is only used if there are just two of something and if it is a type of word that can take a dual form. For example, time periods or things of which there are usually two, like two hands, two eyes, two horns, etc. Whenever you see a dual form, think of the word both. So how do you form a dual? Well, it is actually quite simple. Both masculine and feminine words take the same kind of ending when they become dual. So there is one less thing you have to learn. It looks relatively similar to a masculine plural ending of im. But the hierarch shifts under the yod, and then a patach appears under the last consonant. Here are some examples. First, ozen, ear, becomes aznaim ears, or both ears. So you can see the vowels also change a bit here. Then karen, horn, becomes karnaim, both horns. And the third example is yom, day, and it becomes yomayim, both days. So let's put everything we've seen so far regarding standard forms in a table. Okay, there you go. The dual form of sus is susayim, and it doesn't matter whether it's masculine or feminine. By the way, the word sus probably never occurs in a dual form, but that's okay, this is just to learn the endings. And finally, there are a few interesting words that have a dual form, or they sound like they are dual, but in reality, they are just plain old simple singular. One famous example is shemayim. You may see the patach, the yod, the hirek, and the meme, and then you think, aha, this is a dual. But in fact, it just means singular, heaven, or sky. Yet this special endings has occasionally led to the translation of heavens. Similarly, mayim means water, but because of the ayim ending, it has sometimes been translated as waters. And finally, two common names, namely Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and Mitzrayim, Egypt. They also just refer to one city or one country respectively. So that was singular, plural and dual, their forms and their functions. As you can see, the next video in this series discussing nouns will be about definite and indefinite. And in the meantime, I hope to crank out a few other bonus videos about pronunciation and vocabulary. If you liked the video, then like the video, 
and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Also, you can follow me on social media and share this with someone if you know that they are starting their Hebrew studies.